Okay. Okay, so my name is uh, Jérôme Luat. I'm from uh, France, uh, near Paris, and I am in charge of uh, ambient particulate monitoring for uh, the company NVA. So NVA, we are a French-based uh, company specialized in uh, pollution monitoring uh, systems. So mostly for ambient air and emission monitoring uh, for uh, plants and industrial um, uh, installations. Okay, and of course, as part as the ambient uh, monitoring uh, analyzer, we have some for uh, dust monitoring, PM10, PM2.5, and I'm going to told uh, to explain you how we use beta attenuation to do this kind of monitoring. Okay, so the, the analyzer name is called MP101. Okay, so I I guess most of you are, are quite familiar with the context of uh, particulate matter uh, monitoring. Uh, so main parameter are PM10 and PM2.5. Um, I think you know the meaning, the, the, the number 10 or 2.5 is related to the maximum size of the dust that you are monitoring. So PM10 means the particulate are smaller than 10 micrometers and PM2.5 smaller than 2.5 micro micrometers. Uh, in the past, there was a, a bigger parameter called TSP, total suspended particulate which was lower than 100 micrometer. And uh, in the future, uh, it's probably uh, we will see lower size, maybe uh, PM1. And um, sorry, in my presentation, uh, I, I write MP is the French, uh, uh, the French writing, but uh, it's PM actually, particulate matter. Uh, so in the future, we could see lower size uh, like PM1 or even maybe lower than that if we uh, get interested in the nano particulate. But today's most, uh, uh, most monitoring requirements are uh, based on PM10 or PM2.5 or and PM2, sometimes both uh, PM2.5. Okay, uh, so because they are uh, regulatory monitoring, uh, you have to apply some uh, technical standards. Uh, there is uh, quite many actually now in the world, but the two main ones are the European standard and the US uh, EPA standard. So I know that Thailand is mostly using the US EPA standard. So I will uh, mostly uh, refer to the standard during this presentation, but uh, actually they are not so different. So. Um, uh, fortunately, uh, the, the same parameter uh, are giving the same kind of standard in, in many countries. Okay, a uh, very, very important thing to understand, I, I think most of you already know that, um, there is no reference method for uh, continuous monitoring device. Okay, the, the reference method is the manual sampling and the laboratory filter uh, weight. Uh, so it means any continuous device is only an equivalent method to the reference. Okay. Uh, and the other important thing to always keep in mind when you are comparing technologies or, or analyzer is to keep in mind that because of this reference method is a sampling uh, method, the uh, certification is always done on the 24 hour average. So it means any value that has a shorter period, maybe one second or one minute or one hour, is not a certified value. Okay, now it's not because uh, nobody wants to, to certify it. it, it's because there is no technical standard. Actually, nobody knows how to uh, certify and to, to prove that a second value or minute value or now value is correct. Okay, so any analyzer that gives you a, a second value or minute value, 
you don't know if this value is okay. The only value that can be certified is a 24 hour value average. Okay, so this is very important. When you compare, uh, for example, a beta analyzer with an optical analyzer or uh, a micro balance analyzer, uh, some will give you second value, some will give you hour value, but finally, these values are not satisfied. Okay. Uh, so talking about the technology, I just mentioned them. Uh, there is three main uh, technology that are used that you can find on the market to monitor PM10 or PM2.5. Uh, so the first one is beta attenuation. We are going to, uh, of course, detail it a little bit more in the presentation. Uh, so this technology is uh, the one that has been used for um, the longest time uh, among the, the, all the technology. It started uh, maybe uh, 30 years ago to be to be used. So it's, it's well documented and proven uh, that the physical uh, principle is a, a good way to measure the mass. Uh, the also, the, the way it works makes it uh, usually a robust and reliable uh, technology. Uh, but of course, it is only working on periodic sampling and measurement. Okay, this is why I remembered you the 24 hours uh, topic. Okay, uh, and this is the technology that is used by the most uh, manufacturer also to make uh, analyzer. The second one is a microbalance, uh, oscillating microbalance. Uh, so the measurement is usually quite reliable uh, when you use the analyzer properly, uh, which is not so easy. Um, and to do that, you need quite complicated system with the dryers. And uh, if you do it well, it's relatively expensive uh, to operate because of many consumable and operation. And it gives a uh, almost real time. Usually, it's about a few minutes uh, periodic measurement. Uh, so this uh, this technology was quite popular in the in the two two thousand years from two thousand two thousand ten. But uh, because of the cost and complexness, uh, it is uh, not so used very much to these days in most countries. For example, in France. It was very popular in, in the maybe 2005, uh, 10, and now most of the network they uh, came coming back to beta attenuation, and some of them to light scattering that we are going to see after. And the last technology that is a more uh, new one uh, to be applied in uh, ambient air monitoring is light scattering. So light scattering is uh, using laser to uh, illuminate the dust and measure some signal related to this dust. Um, so it is uh, it has appeared in the monitoring ambient monitoring market about 10, 10 years ago, 10 to 15 years ago for the first ones. Uh, of course, the technology itself is much older, but it was not uh, used for ambient monitoring before. Um, of course. Everybody has different opinion about <laughs> this technology, uh, but generally speaking, you can say that it's not everybody except that is uh, perfectly uh, reliable in terms of measurement, uh, because uh, the, the, the main issue is that uh, there is no physical direct link between uh, the optical measurement and the mass, and so the conversion between scattering signal and the mass depends on the background composition. So basically, Sometimes you may have to recalibrate um, your your analyzer if the background change. So basically, it works well when uh, the pollution is, is is the same. If the pollution change, you may have some differences in uh, in the measurement. Okay, and it's real time uh, from the, the its main principle. But again, this, if you get a certified light scattering analyzer. The only measurement that is certified is a 24 hour average. So it means you take a full day of value and you make the average, and this value only is certified. Okay, uh, so I will focus more on the beta uh, technology for this presentation, but if you have a question on the other one, feel free to ask. We also work on all the technology for. Uh, 
for our devices. Uh, for example, we have optical also devices, just that we don't think it's good enough to be certified. Okay, so how works Betagoge? It's uh, relatively simple. You have two main steps uh, in, in a Betagoge uh, measurement. You have the sampling step. So basically you attract the dust from the air uh, into a filter for a, a given period of time. So you can, in principle, you could choose every period you want, one minute, five minutes, an hour, one day, uh, one week. Uh, the principle is the same. And once you have sampled on your filter, you uh, bring the filter between a, a source, a beta uh, radiation source and the detector, and you measure how much of the radiation is absorbed by the sample. And of course, the more absorption and the more mass. Okay. Uh, the, the strengths of the beta attenuation technology is that the, the radiation that are absorbed by the nucleus of the atoms and the nucleus is what provides the mass. So there is a really direct link between beta attenuation measurement and the mass of material that is uh, exposed to it. Okay, so of course I am I'm, I keep it general. Uh, you the calculation of the attenuation is a little bit more complex than what I explained to you. You need to remove the air, the humidity, so it's uh, uh, relatively complicated. But the principle is is very simple. Okay, so I will uh, come a little bit more into, into the, the MP one hundred one uh, working details. And we will see more so about the beta attenuation technologies in this uh, part. Okay, um, so a few comments on the technical specification. Um, so first thing is the range. So analyzer can go up to 10,000 microgram per meter cube uh, of dust. So it is, of course, very high. Uh, you are very unlikely to meet that in any ambient situation. Um, but uh, what, what I want to, to highlight here is that uh, beta attenuation is very uh, flexible in terms of dynamic. Okay, you can measure very low, but you can also measure very high. Uh, because uh, to measure a high value, you just need to shorten your sampling period. Okay, so the technology itself is very, very easy to adapt to very low or very high uh, concentration, which is not the case, for example, for optics. Optics usually cannot go very high in the, in the concentration because you will saturate your signal. Uh, detectable limit about a few micrometer, a few microgram of per meter cube of dust. Uh, and of course, again, this is related to the period. Of course, if you use a one hour average, you will get uh, more than four microgram per meter cube of detectable limit. But if you increase the period, you will get, you will reduce your detectable limit and improve the accuracy of the system because you will sample more dust on your filter. Okay, so you can select. So this is a, something a little bit special about the MP11. You can select your cycle when you you go on your analyzer interface. You can decide how long you want to uh, sample before doing the measurement. So from half hour, an hour, two hours, up to four, 24 hours, uh, even more than 24 hours. For example, if you have very, very low level, you want to detect very, very low uh, concentration, you could increase the sampling duration. Um, so this is about the measurement cycle. It means how often you bring your filter to the detector. And you have another parameter that you can also select separately from the measurement is a sampling collection period. It means how often you will go to a new blank filter, okay? Because you can measure, uh, you can sample again on the same filter to add on the same uh, on the same sample, or you can switch to a new filter uh, more often. Of course, uh, uh, this is important because it can help you to uh, save some filter to reduce your operating cost. Okay. Um, for example, another uh, analyzer that use beta, they have decided they have fixed uh, a sampling period of one hour, 
I don't know why they choose one hour. Uh, and then you cannot change it. So when you use this analyzer, you have to uh, change the filter every hour. I mean, the system will change the filter every hour by itself. And then uh, the filter, the, the tape, filter tape that you use will be uh, exhausted after about two to three months. It means every two to three months you have to replace it. But if you, you, if you choose a 24 hours, for example, then you can have a filter that will last two to three years. So it means uh, the operating cost of the filter is uh, a lot dif very different. Uh, the sampling flow rate is one meter cube for hours. Uh, so this is uh, the regulated flow rate. So this is a, an important, um, not not something to note. Um, how to say? Um, in the US EPA, also in the Europe, the same principle. The regulator, so the US EPA, in, in the case of uh, US, have uh, designed a uh, sampling head uh, that is mandatory to use for the reference method. Okay, so I will show the head after. Uh, so there is one head for the PM10 uh, and an adapter for PM2.5. In Europe, you have a PM10 head and a PM2.5 head. Uh, so there is a little bit different on that, but the principle is the same. To, uh, to have a reference method uh, approved uh, sampler, you need to use a design that has been made by the USCP. You cannot make your own design. It's, a, it's mandatory. And of course, this design is done at a given flow rate. You cannot choose your flow rate. It's, it's mandatory to use one meter cube per hour for the, the low volume sampler. You have a high volume sampler with different flow rate. Um, and in the US, um, they have decided to impose this flow rate for the PM10 only, also for the equivalent analyzer. Okay, so you cannot get the USCP certification on PM10 if you do not use a one meter cube per hour sampling, which is why if you look in the USCP um, certification um, list. You, you can go on the USCP website, you can find all the analyzer in the world that has been certified, and you will find very, very, very little uh, optical analyzer because most of them, they use a lower flow rate. So many are certified to PM2.5, but not to PM10 because of the flow rate. Um, Okay, then you have the stability of the flow and the operating temperature. Uh, beta attenuation system is uh, relatively independent from the temperature compared to optical because the optical analyzer, they need, uh, they have a laser source, of course, inside. And this laser is very, very dependent on temperature, while uh, beta attenuation is much less uh, affected by temperature. So usually, in the last generation, for example, of the MP11, but I know it's the same for other beta analyzer, you can all even not have an air conditioning uh, device around the analyzer uh, because it will compensate the temperature effect by itself. And there is no component inside that uh, is uh, damaged by variating temperature. So you can use in normal range. So the 0 to 40 degrees is actually what is certified in the in the TUV, the German Institute, uh, because this is a range. Actually, it can go higher or lower. Um, last year, which we made a, a summer campaign in France, it was a very high temperature, and it worked well uh, up to for 55 degrees, uh, because we there was no higher temperature, so we, we couldn't try higher. Uh, but actually, it's very, very uh, tolerant to the temperature fluctuation. So you can use uh, an MP101 uh, in, a, in a, an enclosure without uh, air conditioning. Okay, so this is a, a, another benefit of beta attenuation uh, technology. Okay, um, so let's talk about the components. So all the, of course, beta attenuation analyzer, but even actually all the dust uh, continuous monitor, they have uh, four components. Uh, they, it's always the same. Uh, you have the sampling head at the top. <clears throat> so this is what I mentioned before. It's a, 
uh, designed by US EPA. Um, uh, the sampling head is, uh, is a fixed design. You have the sampling tube that links the sampling head and the analyzer. So this sampling tube is also a very important component. We'll talk about it a bit later. You have, of course, a measuring uh, the measuring box with the beta attenuation inside. And you have an external pump. <clears throat> so the external pump is uh, so is, is, is true for beta attenuation because you need a relatively high flow, one meter cube per hour. Uh, some other technologies, they can use an internal pump because the flow it will be lower, but you must have a pump in any case. Okay, so what is the function of this, those different parts? Uh, of course, the sampling uh, head is meant to cut the size of the dust that is going to go inside the analyzer. So this is what decides if you cut a 10 micrometer or 2.5 micrometer or one micrometer. There is some head also for one micrometer or TSP. So uh, by changing this head, uh, you can adapt your analyzer and switch from PM 2.5 to PM 10. Um, then you have the RST, we call it the Regulated Sampling Tube. Uh, so this tube actually is meant to uh, control the humidity of the sample that is going inside the analyzer. Uh, it's, uh, it's a quite delicate system. Um, what happens actually is that you, of course, in, in some case, and Thailand is a perfect example of uh, I think a quite challenging situation where you have uh, ambient air which is uh, very high humidity and if you sample this humidity inside your analyzer you can create some condensation in the tube which will potentially damage the system okay so you have to uh, control uh, the humidity of the sample, and you do that by heating uh, the, the air that is going through the analyzer. Um, but of course, actually, so this, this uh, kind of technology was uh, designed um, about 10 years, a little bit more than 10 years ago, uh, when people understood, start to understood this pro understand this problem. So at the beginning, all the company just heated at a fixed level, um, like 45 degrees, 55 degrees. And after some time, they realized that if you heat too much, uh, you can uh, vaporize some part, some of the dust, and it can um, change the result of the measurement. So actually, uh, you need to heat uh, the minimum that is needed. Okay, that's why you have a regulation in the tube, so you control the humidity and the temperature of the sample, and you modify the heating depending on those parameters, so that you minimize the possibility of volatile loss in the dust. Okay, so this is a, a, a very difficult uh, topic. Actually, I don't think there is any final and um, final way to, to solve this problem because of course the uh, reference samplers they have the same problem uh, they also need to regulate the, the heating and they can lose some of the volatile also so the reference method is not perfect um, so you have to keep that in mind when you compare different systems and a um, uh, continuous monitor to a reference method you have to to keep in mind this risk of volatile uh, loss um, on the measurement. Of course, it depends what is the chemical composition of your dust. Uh, so sometimes it doesn't matter, um, but sometimes it can matter. Uh, okay, then you have the analyzer itself with the filter and the beta source uh, inside the dust. And you have the pump, which is meant to, of course, provide the sampling flow at a given uh, value. Okay, so it has to control this flow stability. Okay, a few more words about the sampling heads. Uh, of course, a very, very critical part of, uh, of any system. Uh, so here I show you the US EPA sampling head. We call it the louvered head. You, I think you can recognize on, on the top the fact that the, the, the roof is a little bit louvered at the top. It's a typical and uh, recognizable feature of the US EPA sampling head, PM10. Um, 
So you can use this head alone to have a PM10. You can use the PM10 plus uh, we call it VICC, uh, very short cut cyclone. Uh, so this is a device here that we cut and remove the particulate between 2.5 and 10 so that your sampler will go in the analyzer only with particulate below 2.5 micrometers. Okay, you have, of course, the same with the European head. You can adapt the head uh, to the same analyzer uh, because except the head, they're all the same. And you could use potentially other head like PM1 or TSP with the same analyzer. Okay, a, a few words on the VSCC. Uh, so actually, originally, uh, the USCPA designs, the, the official design of the USCPA is not the VSCC is uh, what we call the winds impactor. Uh, maybe some of you which work for more long time in this area, they have uh, manipulated or maybe they still have uh, working with winds impactor to provide the PM 2.5 um, stage. Um, and uh, after, after a while, the winds impactor is, is of course it works uh, well. But you need to fill some oils inside regularly, so the, the operation is uh, um, not great. And uh, some company design alternative design to uh, cut the PM2.5 um, size. And the first one was a VSCC, which I show you on the side here. Uh, and we, so we certify it with a VSCC. And now I, I know there is other other company also designed similar. Uh, similar device. So the VSCC is also certified as an accepted alternative by the USCPA. Uh, and I think uh, there is another one also which is certified now. Uh, so they all use the same principle of cyclone. So you can see here, I, I, sh I show you the drawings of the VSCC. You have a small cyclone here, and this cyclone is uh, the, the, the stage that removes the uh, particle between PM10 and PM2.5, okay? But of course, it has to work after the PM10 head, otherwise it will clog very fast. Okay, um, so of course, these heads, they are mechanically designed, and uh, of course, the PM10 by the USCPA. Uh, VSCC is not a USCPA design, but it's approved by USCPA. And it works only if the flow is at the right value, okay, one meter cube per hour, uh, which is, that's what is, yeah. Question? No, no, just him coming. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. okay. okay uh, so that's why it's very important to keep the flow uh, at the right level. Um, where is my time? Okay. Uh, um, and also very important, if you have any device that is working with another flow, uh, for example, on, on PM 2.5, it's possible. You can have some uh, analyzer that can be certified with another flow. Uh, they cannot use the official heads. They have to design their own sampling head, uh, which will be different from the approved, um, the approved design. Okay. So it, it, this is possible for PM 2.5, but not for PM 10. And there is a reason for that. Um, the reason is that actually um, the sampling head has two functions. The one function, of course, is to cut the size. Inside, there is some mechanical uh, dimensions to make the some size of the particulate blocked while other can pass. But there is also a function with the wind, okay? Uh, of course, the particulate, uh, there's a big difference with the gas. They have uh, uh, inertia. It means uh, if, if you change the direction of the particulate, it will not follow immediately the, the direction, which is why you can cut them in this kind of uh, system. But of course, it's the same outside. When you have a, a wind speed, the particulate will not, um, will not necessarily be attracted by the head if the wind is strong enough. And this is um, all the more true that uh, that the particulate is big. Of course, the bigger the particulate, the bigger it has inertia. And uh, the wind has more impact on the bigger particulate. That's which is why they, they're imposing a flow for the PM10 
but not for the PM2.5 because the PM2.5 are, are smaller particulates, so they are less affected by this problem of wind uh, in the ambient air. Okay, so always keep in mind when you have a especially for PM10, uh, the, the, the different kind of flow and the different head may have an impact on the value you can read. Okay, let's go to the tube, also a very important part. So, of course, you are doing your sampling at ambient temperature because it's ambient monitoring. Uh, so, to, uh, to prevent condensation, uh, you monitor the humidity and the temperature of the air outside, but also inside the analyzer. And you want to make sure that the uh, uh, humidity does not reach 100%, otherwise it will start to condensate. So our current um, algorithm is that if the relative humidity is higher than 50%, then we start to heat in order to prevent this humidity to get higher than 50% at the filter level inside the analyzer. Okay, uh, so as I said, this is very important to have a well-regulated tube to, of course, prevent humidity to reach critical level, but also to avoid the volatile dust removal. Um, so just a small mention about that. If you have a possibility to use a uh, dust analyzer, that do not require air conditioning or do not require a very, very uh, stable temperature in air conditioning. It is advised to let the temperature increase uh, as much as possible to be closer to the ambient level and then it will reduce this effect of uh, condensation. Of course, normally in ambient station, you are, you are having air conditioning not only for the dust analyzer, but also for the SO2 analyzer or other analyzer, which usually are more affected by temperature change. Uh, but if you use a dust analyzer alone, normally, especially if it's a beta attenuation analyzer, you can loosen the air conditioning, um, how to say, you, you don't need to keep a very stable temperature. You could let the temperature increase more, maybe to 25, 30, 35 degrees and uh, it will reduce the impact and the problem of the humidity in the sample. And in any case, even you have gas analyzer or other analyzer that you need to, uh, uh, you, you need to control the temperature better, it is uh, recommended that you choose the, the level of temperature, the, the temperature at high, at high as possible. So it's better to choose 22 degrees and 20 degrees and better 20 than 18 degrees. Of course, it saves energy, but also it is better for the sampling. Okay, so this is a view of inside of the MP11. If you open the door, you will see that. So you have the inlet of the regulated sampling tube at the top. Um, you have the two main filter tape uh, that is a very uh, visible signature of a, a beta attenuation analyzer. You have the sampling area in the middle, so the dust are going through here in the middle. And um, you have the C14 source, the beta source on the side. I will explain you how it works later. But during the sampling phase, it, it is on the side. And you have the Geiger Muller tube below the filter. Okay, and here it's the manual mass gauge. In the standard version, the MP101 is provided with a manual mass gauge that you can use for calibration every, normally every six months or even every year is okay. Uh, the Geiger Muller tube is very, very stable. So normally you don't need actually to recalibrate, but to check, we have a mass, a manual mass gauge uh, inside the analyzer. Okay, so how it works, uh, so you have two modes, as I explained to you at the beginning, you have the sampling mode and the measurement mode. So when you are in the sampling mode, the C14 source is on the side, so it doesn't interact with the sampling. And when you switch to the measurement mode, the filter doesn't move, so this is different from other uh, design of beta attenuation. So the dust, the sample dust do not move from the sampling position. It is a source that is rotating and is going in front of the filter. And then you can do the measurement. And when you, of course, come back to the sampling, you switch back again to uh, the sampling position. Okay. Uh, this is uh, to uh, avoid any 
possible of uh, positioning error, of course, because if your sample spot is not exactly positioned below, you could lose or you could affect the measurement. So the best way to avoid any positioning error is not to move. Okay, so we choose to keep the sample at the same place and to move the source instead of moving the sample. Okay, uh, then if you go at the back of the analyzer, you have all the, the board and the mechanism, you have the filter tape rotating um, component. Uh, here's a filter tape, here's a flow meter uh, controller here. And uh, here I mentioned an automated match course. So this is an optional device, an optional module that we can plug in if requested to perform the mass gauge automatically. Uh, to be honest, it's not necessary, but some users, they have asked this function so we can provide it if it is requested. Uh, I, I didn't specify on that. Uh, where is it here? If you check at the different uh, beta attenuation analyzer on the market, you will find that they share some thing in common. Most of them will use a C14 beta source. Uh, most of them, they will have a filter tape. Uh, but uh, strangely, they most uh, when you look at different device, they have different detector. Okay, uh, so each detector have their own uh, advantage and, and, and of course uh, disadvantage. Uh, so we choose to use a Geiger Muller tube. Uh, Geiger Muller tube is a, it's a very sensitive uh, detector, it's the most sensitive detector in the, at, in the radiation uh, technologies. Uh, the only disadvantage is that you need a high voltage supply. Okay, so in the back of the analyzer you have a special board that is providing a thousand volt uh, supply to the Geiger Muller tube. So it's a high voltage, but a very low uh, current. Huh? So it's not it's not a very high consumption. Uh, and otherwise, except this disadvantage, it's very stable, very sensitive. Um, so we think it's the best detector, and we think the, the high voltage is not so big a disadvantage. So we decide to use this detector. Some others they use an organic scintillator or other device which are less sensitive and more affected by a drift. Uh, so some other device they need to recalibrate very often to, to prevent the drift. The GM tube is not affected by the drift. Okay, uh, yes, so the, um, this is a flow control. Um, so we, it's, a, it's using an orifice. You have two pressure sensors, you control the pressure before and after the orifice and this give you uh, the flow, you can calculate the flow and then you regulate a small valve inside before you go to the pump and this is how you can control the flow stability. Also again, so orifice, it's a very, very robust technology uh, for flow control. Okay, uh, this part I already explained. So this is the difference between cycle, measurement cycle and, and sampling period. So you can mix, this is just to to show you that you can mix the, the sampling and the measurement period at a different level. Um, interesting to note that uh, if ever you have a high peak of dust in, in, in a given day or a given moment, uh, you can clog the filter. So it means if the, if the quantity of dust on the filter becomes too high, of course the flow cannot pass. Uh, so the system will detect that and it will switch to a new filter automatically okay so you don't have to worry about these kind of problems and uh, that's why we recommend except if you absolutely want to have an hourly value for example to keep the 24 hour sampling then you can save a lot on the filter consumption okay so you have a, a color screen this is the last version of the analyzer uh, that will show you this is a very interesting view of the synoptics this is a quite a special screen we have. I don't know why the other manufacturers do not do the same. This is a screen that gives you the main parameter of your system in one screen. So you can see the pressure uh, of the orifice, the temperature of the pressure, the humidity, uh, everything you have on your system. And of course, if one parameter is not normal, you will see a red, um, it will be shown in red. 
So you will know that maybe your flow here uh, or your pressure or your humidity is not correct and then maybe you have, you have something to do. Okay. Uh, we could have different language. Uh, I'm waiting uh, uh, near this to translate it in Thai, maybe one day. <laughs> it's possible. Uh, we can provide the, the, the text file and, and have a Thai menu if, uh, if it's requested. Um, at least the software allows this uh, this function. Okay, a uh, very brief overview about the data management. I can see that the time is running fast. Um, so we designed, this is the last generation that was released a few years ago. Uh, so we adapted to a new, the new way of communication, so mostly a numerical way. So basically, you have um, a web server inside. So it means the analyzer itself has its own web page, uh, and you connect. You can control the analyzer from any uh, anywhere as long as it is connected on the internet. You just use a I don't know Chrome or Google uh, anything. You can if you know the IP address, you can connect on the website of the analyzer and do anything the same as if you were in front of the analyzer. You have the same menu. Uh, you have you will you have you will have this page and you can see everything and do everything exactly the same as if you are physically in front of the screen. Okay, you have of course TSP, TCP, USB connection. Um, we remove the let's say more traditional uh, uh, data communication way and they, they can be available with the optional module with uh, for example the analog output or RS232. So we can, if you still need that, we can do with an external module, a converter module. Okay. Um, we also integrated inside the memory of the screen all the documents. So when you receive an MP11 or also other uh, ambient analyzer, you will have the manufacturing certificate, all the control document, the manual. The quick start, they all will be in PDF inside the memory. So if you want, you can read them directly from the screen or with a USB key, take them out and print them if you want, or read them on, on your computer. Uh, so you don't have to worry about where is my paper. It's all here inside. And uh, when your engineer come on site after, they always can find all the documentation uh, directly on the analyzer. Uh, okay, so this is a little bit special about our own software. So it works, of course, with uh, many, many uh, software available everywhere. We have our own data management software, but it works with all the other ones, with Anvidas, with everything. It works uh, the same. Okay, and a few modules that are optional, just mentioned briefly. So if you look at the MP11 analyzer itself, you have two kind of accessories. Some is mandatory, it means you need them to for the analyzer to work. Uh, you have the sampling head, of course. You have the sampling tube. You can choose the size. And you have the pump. You can also have different kind of pump, but uh, you need a pump, of course. And the optional ones are, of course, uh, um, optional uh, data output for analog, for example, or RS-232. You have the automated automass check, that is not mandatory to have inside, but we can add. And we have a real-time optical module that we fix outside and can give you a real-time second value between the um, hourly or 24 hours uh, value if you want to have a real-time indication. Remember always it is an indication because it's not certified. Okay, and then you have some accessories for the uh, calibration. You have the zero uh, particle HEPA filter to do a zero. What? Uh, you have some connector because this zero you can do on the top of the tube when the analyzer is installed or directly in the analyzer itself to check for the leak, to check for the zero. Uh, of course, you need a flow meter, a temperature sensor to calibrate the flow and the temperature. Uh, but probably most of you already have this tool, so it will work fine with uh, the, the analyzer also. Okay, and that's it. I think I'm almost right on time. Uh, so my was, was it okay 45 minutes well, here we are so now I think we have about 10 minutes for question uh, if you have any I hope 
I'm not sure everyone can can use the right hands on the on the ah. application. I'm not. Normally, so you can I, write on the computer. Yeah. If no one has a question, I have some question about uh, the RST control tube. Yeah. Uh, can, can you go to the, the RST control tube? I'm worried about it because in Thailand have a heavy rain, especially in the rainy seasons. Uh, yes. Uh, how is it heating? It's always heating in the 45 degree or it's compensated with the ambient air temperature? Yeah, it's compensated. It's compensated. Compensate. So basically, it will uh, it will heat in order to keep the, the, the humidity below 50%. So if there can is a humidity... The, can you show the presentation? On that? Ah, it's, uh, you, it's not shown there? Okay, sorry. Um, I thought it was already uh, here. Uh, yes. So yes, it will... Uh, huh? What's wrong? Yeah, it, it will uh, control the humidity at the filter level inside the analyzer and it will, it will heat uh, to keep this humidity at uh, maximum 50%. Uh, and there is a cap, so it means normally it's... Uh, I don't remember the value. There is a cap value inside the analyzer. It will, it will not allow the system to heat more than, I think, 50, 50 degrees or 55. Uh, but this is a uh, this is set in the system. So if I know some in India, especially in India, we have met some case where it was not enough, and then we can increase uh, the temperature to make mm -hmm. sure that the humidity will not be uh, too high. Okay, so uh, we have a let's say a default setting that will uh, limit the, the the temperature and this kind of thing. Because if you go higher than that, you can start to affect the measurement a little bit. Uh, but it's possible to go higher if, if you are uh -huh. in a special situation where the humidity is really, really high. And uh, maybe for some reason you need to, um, to have a low temperature in your shelter that will increase the problem. Uh, then we, have a, we, we can adjust the parameter in the analyzer to uh, match this special situation. Okay. But the, the, yeah. Oh, sorry. The inside have a, a humidity sensor. Yes. Or how is kept? How is you have two. Humidity. You have two humidity sensor. You have one humidity sensor outside here. Oh, uh, yes. Inside. Small meter station, and you have a uh, temperature and oh. humidity sensor inside the block here uh, uh -huh. to know what is the humidity of the sample that is uh, okay. arriving on the filter. Uh -huh. you, you need that because uh, uh, remember here. Okay. When you are doing the measurement, you need to remove uh, the, as the absorption related mm -hmm. to the air. And the, what is uh, absorbing more in the air is the humidity. So actually, you need to measure the humidity here mm -hmm. to make sure you have a correct beta attenuation measurement. Mm -hmm. And so then we use this measurement also for the regulation of the tube. So, and the second question, you, you mentioned about uh, the man, man of mass gas, it's automatic calibration yeah, for the two. analysis. We have two ways to control the mass. Where is it? So basically what is a mass dose? Is a mass dose is that you, you put a, a known value of dust between the detector and the source, okay? So if, for example, you have a mass gauge here, which is at, uh, I don't know, 10 uh, milligram oh, of it's, dust. It's a set, it's a standard, right? Yes, like so it is a standard, standard. it is a standard gauge. So actually it is a filter, it is a, oh, a, plas it is a plastic film, and inside oh, this plastic film you have some dust inside. And this dust has been calibrated by a reference laboratory in France. So they said this value is so much milligram per centimeter per square centimeter, and then when you put the mass here, 
uh, the, the analyzer will read how much milligram, and then you check if the value is matching what is the real value of the mass. Okay. Yeah. Normally, it's okay. It should be uh, maybe more or less five percent. If it's not okay, then you have to adjust the uh, the mass reading in the system. Okay, but most of the time it will not change. It, it is really stable. Uh, so that's why normally we recommend to do this mass check uh, every six months. And usually it's it's still okay. Actually, you just check, but you don't have to adjust. Uh, but some customer because they are used. For, to other device that has automatic check, they ask us if we could design an automatic system, and then we can add this inside. Then we have a we had a small uh, component here that can insert the George maybe every day, for example, every week, automatically inside the analyzer. So it's possible for we for this device is not really important. We, we think it uh, actually it's, uh, the drift is always good, but. If you want to be sure, if you want to feel safe, then we, we can add. Okay. The, the last question of from, from me. You mentioned about uh, the coating popping. Some You're sorry? customer have yes, the coating, the, the block when when the dust is high. Yes. When the dust is high. You have the automatic uh locate the filter. Yes. Right? Yes, so when the, because we measure the flow with the pressure sensor, uh -huh. oh. uh, we, we measure the pressure. So we know what is the absolute pressure of the flow. You can see on the screen here, where is it? Here. You see you have the pressure before the orifice and after the orifice. They are, uh -huh. they are very close, but it gives you an idea about the pressure. We also have the pressure uh, inside the block here. And if this pressure becomes too low, it means you know that uh, there is a, a problem of, uh, of clogging, potentially clogging on the filter, and then you will the system will automatically move to a new clean filter. And of course, if it doesn't solve the problem, it means the clogging is probably in the head. You have to clean the head, ah. but uh, mostly, usually, it's on the filter. Uh, and actually, uh, actually, you will you will detect this before. Oh, you really have to clog because then you can break the filter. The risk is that if the pressure difference becomes too high, the filter can break and you have a, a, some kind of hole inside the filter. Okay. That's all for my question. Now you have a five minute. I'm not sure everyone can raise the hand on the application or not. I think we'll be finished today. Okay. So if you have some question coming later, uh, feel free to, to come to me. And uh, I will answer the best as I can.